thing on. Good morning. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? We're cold, but we're good. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I have about three pages in here that I wrote last night, sorry. Uh, this is something that came to me on Friday. It's something that I had for a while, but I think the Lord was waiting to reveal to me the right time to bring this up. So what I want to talk to you today uh, is about the blood. So, you know, the Lord speaks to us when we least expect it and through the least expected things. So Friday, um, I was walking to the library downtown to return some CDs that I had borrowed. And as I'm walking down the street, I see some blood spatter on the sidewalk. And then he started talking to me about the blood. So I saw that. It's like, this is very odd, but whatever. Anyway, sorry, I've got to mute this, I've got an email. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, my mother was talking, talking to me about a teaching that she uh, attended that was uh, about the blood of Jesus. And in this specific teaching, it talks about the seven spills of Jesus' blood. So I want to talk to you today about some of those things that I feel like the Lord wants me to share. Uh, regarding that. So the first blood spill, faithfulness. And this is when he was in the Mount of Olives. So Luke 22, verses 41 through 44 says, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him and being in an agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground so why did Jesus suffer such agony well because of man's sin due to Satan's lie and because he was the only one that could take our place so why is it important the blood that was spilled in the Mount of Olives because it frees us from the lies of the enemy in our lives. Through his blood, we have the possibility of having the mind of God and not the thoughts and lies of the enemy. It frees us from the yeah. words of condemnation and lies of others in our lives. And it also frees us from the words of condemnations and lies we have said about others. It also frees us from the betrayal and deceit we have suffered from those we trusted. The second blood spill redemption this is when he was flagellated why was this blood necessary so we could be redeemed to be presented as the best offering to God to cover our sin to heal us the third blood spill conquest this is when he was crowned Mark 27 29 says in twisting together a crown of thorns they put it in his head and put a reed in his right hand. The crown signifies his reign. Man had lost his government on earth. In Christ, it is regained. The blood spilled because of the crown, when it fell on the earth, breaks the curse. Now the earth can produce blessing. The crown of thorns brings freedom. That freedom is so that you can be productive in every aspect of your life. The fourth blood spill, identity. When he was spit on, struck, and his beard pulled. When man sins, his identity, his likeness to God is distorted. Christ took our distorted identity so we could regain our identity as children of God. This blood produces acceptance, support, strength, courage. First Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Fifth law spill, productivity, when his hands were nailed. 
This blood gives us the, the anointing. So why is the anointing or the power of the Holy Spirit for? Well, to love all, to produce riches, to perform miracles. You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The sixth blood spill, purpose. When his feet were nailed, this blood was spilled so that your life has direction, so that you are always in the right place, so that you find the perfect time, so that you are brought together with the right people. And the seventh blood spill, consecration. When his side is pierced, and this blood was spilled so that we could walk with him. Matthew 26, verses 27 through 29 say, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for, many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as I was reading through this, I started thinking, one of the hardest stains to remove is a blood stain. But through the blood of the Lamb, we have been washed and we have been cleansed. And that is a blood that cannot be removed. We are in a covenant with Almighty God. We are his children. And we will drink of it again when we are together with him in his kingdom. That's what I got. So. I hope that made sense. It did to me yesterday when I was writing it in my mind. So anyway, uh, anyone has any prayer requests, testimonies they would like to share? Jody.
he gets pregnant. You know, the doctor says a wait a while to, to do chemo and then get to take the baby and save the baby. But I'm just asking all of you to continue to stand at, for prayer against this cancer. I mean, we just heard Don and, and Jane's testimony. You know, cancer doesn't have a chance. No. You know, it's in the power of God. So I right. just ask yeah. that we stand together and, yeah. and pray for Ashley. Yeah. And what is the, what is the definition of salvation? One of, one of it's deliverance and healing. Yeah. 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 Right. So I'm believing that her, her family, and some of the people associated with her, this baby, um, that God has got them in his hands and the lives will be directed to him. Amen. Yes. 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 And also, I don't believe Jane's here yet, but she's been sick for a while. And I talked to her on Thursday. I had no idea. She'd been in the hospital for several days with a severe case of vertigo. Um, supposedly, you have like crystals in your ear and, it, and if they get messed up, it messes up your balance. Mm -hmm. And hers, that's what's happened to her. And we just need to stand for her healing Amen. with her Amen. and um, just coming against the lies the enemy speaking to her and the discouragement and, right. and the sickness and the vertigo and whatever you want to call it.
All right, let's stand. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today to be gathering your name, Lord. We thank you for the blood, the blood that washed us, that redeemed us, Father. For you draw us closer to you, Lord. Because of your blood, Father, we have healing. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> we have healing, Lord. We have prosperity. We lift those up right now that are in need of healing, Father. Those that are in need of restoration of comfort, Father. In your mighty name, we declare right now your victory, the manifestation of your blessings, of your mighty power in our lives right now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for those that are here. We thank you for those that are not here physically, but are here in spirit. For we know, Father, that you are calling your children, bringing them over here. You are releasing the power of the Holy Spirit in this place, Father. And we know that you are preparing wonderful miracles, not only for this church, but for this region, for this nation, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for you are doing in our lives, for the testimonies, Father. Thank you, Jesus. For the healing, for the comfort. Jesus, for your blood, for the greatest gift given us to your only Son, Lord, so that we can come to you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for making us your righteousness. We are his children. He loves us no matter what. And there's nothing that can come against us. We're lions. Woo! I'm excited. Glory. Anyway, do we have any announcements? Yeah. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah. So, Tim, what was that verse that you just spoke about? I was once young. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, we appreciate you. Yes. Happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you. And uh, many more years to come. Yes. I know you have the Caleb anointing on you. Um, as Karen Carpenter wrote out, we've only just begun. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Forget Jody, hers is birthdays on That's Tuesday, right. and she'll be years old, 18 again. Okay, so yeah, so happy birthday to you also. Any other February birthdays in here? Come on, all right. Well, happy birthday to you guys. We appreciate you and pray for a blessed time in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! And we have cake after service. That's what I heard. Uh, and also because of Iowa law, there will be no fermented beverages. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's speak the word. <laughs> will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. 
Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake. And no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Toby and John, would you mind taking the offering? So we can you say the blessing, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Lord, we're so thankful to be here today. Your name is Jesus. We give you the glory. You have made us in your likeness and in your image. God, we know perfection is your game, Lord God. Yeah. You don't do anything halfway. God, we have to remind ourselves that your word is the truth. Everything around us is not void, Lord God, and a lie. It comes a mask steal from us the truth that you have given us. Yeah. That you have brought us here to yeah. shed your light on this world. Yeah. You are our king and we are your ambassadors here on this world. Yeah. And we will declare your truth yeah. and stand in yeah. it. Yeah. For it is faithful and yeah. true. Yeah. God, now we just ask that you move the remainder of this service, Lord God. Yeah. Open our ears that we will hear yeah. your word and yeah. it will sink in yeah. and take root in our life, Lord yeah. God. Yeah. Now we ask that you will bless this offering. Bless the gift and the giver in the mighty yeah. name of Let's worship. Sunday, <laughs> and this is the way it's going to be. I, I mean, I, I must be missing something because they must have it right down, and they hear specifically from God what's going to happen on Sunday morning when everybody gets here, and those who decided that they weren't come come, and those who were going to come aren't coming. And here it is, ten o'clock, and this the worship list has changed three times. Yeah. Okay, it's because of what you're spoken. There was a couple songs that we we're going to do, and we had, after after the first song or whatever, I had two choices, and I don't know which way it goes. The Lord just said, wait till see who shows up. Well, that happened. And then other things started getting spoke out. Other things started getting declared. So um, by the industry standards, I'd be a total mess. But you know what? We're not doing the industry standards. We're doing God's standards. He is, his ways are higher than our ways. And if we can't follow his river, then we're going to wind up on a beach somewhere, and it's going to get flat, and I'm going to get sand in my eye, and it's going to be a mess. So, you know, let's just get in the river and go for a ride. Amen. And uh, every time I'm in that situation, I just always see uh, Snoopy and Charlie Brown and all these guys rafting down the Colorado River. I, I saw Peter in the raft, too, with them. So. Let's just go for a ride and, and uh, love on Jesus because he's worthy of our praise.
sails up.
train fills the temple. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us up, Lord.
I believe you're my healer, Jesus. I believe you're has to leave here without receiving whatever they have need for. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is so real. I know he's always here. He's always with us. But I think sometimes the Lord just gives us an extra sensation of, of his presence to help us to believe that where he is, miracles happen. You can declare what God has promised you and have every expectation, every reason to be satisfied with his answer. It's more than enough for whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance. He's bigger than any need that we have. Hallelujah. Cancer is no different to God than the common cold. You know, a million dollars is no different than ten dollars. Amen. Relationships. He's the master of restoring relationships. He starts with us and him. And he restores that relationship with him. And then he begins a restoration in our life with all the relationships that we have, that we will ever have. Amen. He is the reconciler. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Hallelujah. Give him a big hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Mike. Good job. God bless everybody. Great work. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you all. You may be seated. And for those of you <clears throat> lesser angels who were not born in February, our sympathies go out to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, at the risk of being redundant, which I am the master of, I'm going to repeat a story I told Wednesday night because most of you weren't here Wednesday night. So 
so it'll be good. And those of you that were here, you can just laugh like as if you heard it for the first time. Yeah, that is, if you thought it was funny. You know, we talk about uh, being a, a true representation of God and uh, representing him in a way. And this is what everybody's basically we're talking about here. Uh, if we're going to represent God, or represent God, then obviously when we lay hands on the sick, they ought to recover. When we cast out a demon, that thing ought to go and not come back. And, uh, so whatever it is we're doing, it ought to be a, a true representation of God. And uh, so with that in mind, there was a young boy, a little boy who, who wanted a bike, a bicycle, and he wanted it desperately, but his parents either wouldn't or couldn't buy one. So he decided, well, I, I got to figure out some way to get this bicycle. I can't earn enough money. I can't a, a job. If I get a job, it won't pay anything because I'm just a little kid. And so uh, one of the kids at school told him, he said, well, why don't you pray? Well, he'd never really heard much about praying. He'd, he'd gone to uh, Catholic uh, church with his parents a few times, but never really had any connection with any real religion. And so uh, he thought, well, I'll just watch Christian TV and find out how to pray. So he turned on Christian television, and the first day he watched a a high church, like an Anglican, Anglican church, and he watches it in a couple, three hours, he watches it, and then he turns off the TV, and he goes in his bedroom, and he kneels down next to his bed, and he says, O oh, thou most holy God, Father, glorious Lord, wouldst thou, if it be thy will, grantest thou servant a bicycle? <laughs> in thy most holy name, Jesus. So the next day he gets up, he goes out, he looks all around the yard, all over the house, no bicycle. So we thought, well, that didn't work. He goes back to the TV, turns on Christian TV, and this time he turns it to a charismatic channel. He watches that for two or three hours, and then he turns the TV off, he goes in the bedroom, and he says, Father, I declare a red bicycle with chrome fenders, and I declare it in my front yard tomorrow morning by 8 o'clock. It shall be there. I receive it. And I believe it in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, the next morning he gets up and goes out to the yard and no bicycle. So he shakes his head. He goes back in, turns on the TV again, watches another Christian channel. A couple of hours go by. He gets up, turns off the TV, goes out into the living room, picks up this statue of Mary, leaves the house, and his mother's watching him. He goes out into the woods and he's gone for about two hours. Then he comes back without the statue, goes into the bedroom. She follows him to see what he's going to do. And he gets down on his knees by the bed and begins to pray. And he says, Lord, if you ever want to see your mother again. Praise the Lord. And uh, it is funny, but imagine how what people who are not believers, think when they watch a lot of what's on Christian TV. It looks more like a consumer pitch for I'm selling my thing, my program, my deal. And, and, uh, and it's just such a untrue representation of Jesus. And it's distortion. And because of that, not only does it confuse the unbeliever, it creates questions even in the minds of believers. I mean, you can, I mean, you can turn on the thing and just, you can hear anything imaginable and a lot of stuff that's just not imaginable. I mean, it just doesn't make sense from any perspective. So, But I want to talk to you this morning about, you know, if, if, if you're trying to achieve something that you believe God has promised you, and if it's in this book, he's promised it to you. You just need to find it and know that it's for you. And what I've learned over the years is that what God generally promises are things that I can't produce. No matter how much I want it or how hard I try, I just can't make it happen. So if what it is you're believing God for is something you can do, it's probably not from God. doesn't mean that it's wrong. doesn't mean you shouldn't have it or can't have it. It just means 
when God gives you a promise, it's always something beyond your natural ability to achieve. Therefore, it makes it difficult to believe for. And that's why he wants us to believe him. If it was easy to believe for, it wouldn't take God to do it. You could just do it, right? So I want to use an example this morning uh, to, to help us see, because we all got big, big things we want to see in our life. Too big for us. In fact, too big for us even to imagine. We're, we're thinking this is a big deal. But in the mind of God, what we're believing is still pretty small compared to what he really wants to do. So I want to show you something that's probably the greatest promise and greatest uh, exercise of faith or belief in God, I think, in the Bible. Now, you can argue that, but I, I think this is just outrageously huge. And, uh, and God is not a respecter of persons. He wants to do something not just significant, but something outrageous in our lives. And we need to believe that if we're going to have the kind of impact that we know God wants to have in this world. We need to be something more than natural people. We need to be supernatural. We need to operate out of our true identity, which is Christ. Amen? So let's look at uh, Luke chapter 1. It's a long uh, series of reading here just because I want to get the whole context. You're all familiar with it, I know, but just because we're going to go back and speak about some of these individual scriptures as we go. But Luke chapter 1 and we'll read verses 26 through 45. And I want you to just kind of try to take your mind out of the normal way that we think of this as the Christmas story and so on and so forth. But this is a young woman who's getting a promise from God. Now, God wants to do the same for you. But you're going to have to do what she did in order to see it. And the, the size of your miracle is based on your perception of the size of God. In other words, what God can do in your life. That's why we preach all of this about grace. It's not just so we have a free pass to do anything we want to do, but to understand that God wants to give us favor in spite of us. And all he asks of us is to believe, whether it's the, the moment of salvation, whether it's healing, deliverance, which all is encompassed in salvation, but any need that you have comes as a gift from God and the only thing you do is believe for it. So whatever your promise, whatever your mountain, whatever your hope, whatever your expectation, <coughs> let's believe really big so that God can be revealed for what he really is, yes. a big God, a God that is the God of the impossible. Amen? Amen? So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Grace, amen. Thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his king, of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. I'll just remind you, we're talking about God using people. You look at these women over and over, God uses women who couldn't naturally have a child. I mean, they were barren. I don't know, Sarah, you know, uh, Elizabeth, Hannah. Uh, over and over and over, you see God do supernatural, powerful things through women who were incapable of doing it in the natural way, on their own. Amen? It's the same with men. You, you, you got Gideon 
God always takes the second son under the under the the culture of their day. The first son inherited everything. Everybody else was on their own. But God goes out of his way to put Abel before Cain, to put uh, Jacob before Esau, and on and on and on. Why? Just because he wants to show he doesn't do stuff the way we do stuff. He doesn't operate the way we do. So if you think he's going to do it the way you want him to do it, it probably isn't going to happen that way. And that's what confuses us because we're looking at the moment by moment thinking this ought to be happening now and then this ought to be happening then and then after that this will happen and then the outcome will be this. But it rarely ever happens that way. It usually looks like nothing's happening the way it's supposed to. It's either going the opposite direction or nothing's happening at all. And then all of a sudden, bang, out of the clear blue, something goes and, and changes the whole situation. You go, what in the world was that? Well, that was God. That was his favor that overcomes whatever the circumstance or the situation is. So she, this, here's this older woman been unable able to conceive her entire life. All of a sudden, bang, she's pregnant. She's six months along. Amen. And uh, she's been called barren. But with God, what? Nothing shall be impossible, which is we have heard that over and over and over here this morning, even in the songs after the testimonies. Amen. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country and haste into the city of Judah. And entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Praise the Lord. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told of her, or told her from the Lord. Amen. So he said, you're, the, you're blessed because you believe. Because you believe, what the Lord promised is going to be performed. Yeah. All right. So I want to begin in a kind of a backward way here, but... If you understand the Jewish mind, the Shema, you know, it's uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, if you really, if you just think about this, if you believe God, if you believe in God, then by definition, you've got to believe that anything's possible, right? right? Yeah. It's what Suzanne was saying. Yeah. This is the God that hung the north on nothing, you know, that just spread the stars in the sky and creates everything. Light. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Firmament. Man. Animals. The whole work. Everything. So how can we ever think if we believe that? Yeah, right. How can we believe that anything's impossible for him? Right. So the question is, what does he want to do? Uh -huh. Not a question of what he can do because obviously he can do anything or we, or we wouldn't be sitting here today. The stars would be under us and the water would be above us and who knows what else. Everything would be backwards or upside down or inside out. So we know that he can. Now it's a question of will he? What does he want to do? Well, that's why we have the word of God. That's the main reason for the word of God is to know the will of God. So you know what God wants to do. Then you know if that's what he wants to do, then obviously he's going to do it if I'll just believe him for it. Okay? So what we need to look at here is what, what do we learn from this angel about who Jesus is. Amen? Look at verse 35. Because again, I'm not trying to mess with your head here. I, I'm trying to say, what's, what is Mary going through here at this point? Right? So Mary, this little Jewish girl, is getting this report. Now you've got to understand from that Jewish perspective, this is really way more than just a savior is coming. It's who this savior is that she has to be able to believe. Praise the Lord. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 44. Now, in the 
context of this conversation, these Jews are attacking Jesus. If you go on to chat, uh, verse 48, 49, 47, 48, and on through there, which we won't go there, but just for the sake of time. But Jesus is having this dialogue with the Pharisees who are saying he's a demon, he's demon-possessed, he's a Samaritan, which they, was a hated half-breed kind of uh, low life in the minds of the Jewish people. And uh, they're, they're going on and on and on about his uh, deceptiveness, the fact that he's deceiving people to claim that he's equal with God, that he's a son of God, which makes him equal with God, to say things like, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They're going nuts. They're, they're freaking out with this, what they consider to be blasphemy. Now, this is, the, this is the normal Jewish thought based on what they have been taught and what they have believed for, for centuries. And so Jesus says this to these Jews. You're the father of the, you're, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Right. Now, if, if we were to go on, you'd, you'd come to verse, I think it's 48, where Jesus says, he goes through this whole thing about how they, you, you don't get this at all. Your father is somebody that you just follow in the steps of. You, you imitate, you, you act like him, and that, that's why I call him your father. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus says, there's more to this relationship with me and my father than me just trying to be like him or trying to act good like God does or do things that God does. Because he goes on to say to them, you say that Abraham's your father. Well, he said, Abraham prayed to see my day. Right? And they said, come on, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham's been dead for 1,000 years, uh, 2,000 years, and you're going to tell me that Abraham saw him? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Now that, you've got to understand, to the Jews, that freaked them out. They, they know who he's talking about. He's saying, I'm God. Yeah. He's not making any bones about it at this point. And, of course, at that, from that moment on, they tried to kill him. They, they, they had their minds made up, this guy is insane at best, or else he's a complete demon of some kind. So, children of the devil, he tells them. But again, the title means a lot more than Jesus was just a follower of God, based on the explanation I just gave you, right? right. Look at, uh, let's look at verse 33, back in uh, Luke chapter 1 again. Leave, leave that up there for a second. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Praise the Lord. This is the angel telling this to Mary. So he's going to reign. This child of hers is going to reign forever. And then, maybe because the angel knows that Mary's going to have a tough time believing what she's hearing here, right? He makes the same statement in another way when he says... And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. That's right. So he's like saying, I, I meant it when I said forever. I wasn't, this was not a metaphor. This wasn't a symbolic kind of way of expressing myself. I'm saying this guy is eternal. He's going to rule and reign forever. His kingdom, there shall be no end. It won't end. So she, he, he's telling her, and, and you understand what I'm saying. He's saying this is not a political king I'm talking about. Because the Jews, including his own disciples, believed that almost, in fact, right up to the very end, they thought, yes, he's the Messiah, but he's going to come on a white horse here any minute, and he's going to defeat Rome, and he's going to be, we're, he's going to set up his kingdom, a political kingdom here on earth. That is what they believed. That's why they were so confused and, and uh, unsure of what was going on after his death. Right. Instead of going to the, to the tomb expecting a resurrection, they went to the tomb looking for a dead body. And when the body wasn't there, they didn't say, praise the Lord, we've had a resurrection. They said, somebody stole him. Yeah. Somebody stole the body. 
So you understand what I'm saying? They didn't look at this the same way we do 2,000 years after the fact with hindsight plus all the New Testament. So Jews had this same uh, inability to believe in a resurrection as we have, as natural people today do. So for Mary to believe this thing is forever, I'm telling, we're talking about something really big. This isn't going to just be a very unusual pregnancy. This is going to be something so outside the realm of possibility that nobody can believe it. Now, I want you to put your situation into this context. I know it looks that big to you because it always looks that big to me when I'm the one facing it. But listen, it's nothing, nothing in comparison if you can believe what Mary believed. Now, she goes on and, and, and uh, the, the, the angels say, I, I mean forever. So there is a promise that this child, which is about to be born, won't just be a political king, but he's going to have a kingdom that's going to last forever. And the implication is that he is more than a mortal being. Right? Then the angel says, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Yes. And the holy thing that's born will be called the Son of God. Yes. Not just because his character will resemble God, but because he has the same DNA as God. He's not going to be a great follower of God. He's going to be God but he's going to be in a man. Now, I don't know about you, but about this time, my head would have been spinning like the exorcist. And there'd have been more than green pea soup coming out of me. I'd have been screaming and hollering and going, my God, this is insane. I'm a, come on. Work with me a little bit here. God's giving you a promise. I'm telling you, it's nothing in comparison to this. It may be big, it may be seem enormous, it may seem impossible, but I'm telling you, it isn't as big as this. Right. It isn't that big a deal when you start putting it in the context of what this young girl right. is hearing. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Because the very divine nature of God is going to be implanted in Mary in a physical form. Therefore, the one to be born will be perfectly holy, absolutely <coughs> sinless, and will live forever as both divine and human. As a person. <laughs> Mary gets it. She's a Jewish girl. She knows what's being said to her, and this, if you think it was difficult for the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees to receive what Jesus was saying, this is bigger even yet than that. Yes. Because it's you, young girl, unmarried, yes. girl who has no respect in the culture, in the society, right. can't even testify in court. Nobody listens to a woman in those days. Boy, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> I'm telling you. We, I have a guy in here who knows we're listening, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. We have ears to hear. Here. Listen up. She's talking. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, that is an absolutely astounding, and I can't think of enough adjectives, it, it's just too much of a statement. Mm -hmm. It's beyond. It's like when I, 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 I get the Powerball with the power play and the mega bucks with the mega flyer, and then I say, any other adjective you want to throw in there will be fine with me. Like, winner, 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 whatever, you know? I mean, this is like added, piling on. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Well, I know I'm shocked you right now. You're trying to pray through over the fact that I bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> well, I usually don't. I give the money to Sally and have her do it. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But here's another thing we learn about him. His name is Jesus, which means God who saves. Yes. Praise the Lord. 
Now, I want you to think about any other religion, because we're, we live in a world now where this everything is has to be qualified equally. Yeah. Has to be, you know, there can't be differences. There can't be change. I mean, that's politically incorrect. It's, it's unfair. It's homophobic. It's Islamophobic. It's it's Baptist phobic. It's whatever you know any phobia you want to come up with. Everything has to be equal. So this is something altogether beyond that. Amen? Because every other religion, even the founder of every other religion, go check it out for yourself. Hindu, Buddhist, Islam, I mean, down the list. Just, uh, just pick one. Every other one, the founder comes as a human, as a guide to show you how to get to God. Right? right? It's going to give you a plan or a means by which you can come to God. You never see a claim of any of these, whoever it is, Buddha, Muhammad, they don't claim to be God. They're a messenger. They're someone who's going to lead you to God, show you how to get to God. Uh, every one of them. They don't even claim to be a redeemer. They don't claim to be able to redeem you. They just claim that I'll point you in the right direction. If you do everything you're supposed to do, that I tell you to do, then you might have a shot at redemption. They don't claim to be a savior. They're prophets. They're guides. They're, they're gurus. They're some way of helping you to find your way to God. But the Bible says that, as we already heard here today, Jesus is the way. He's not pointing you to a way. He is the way. Hallelujah. He is the way to God. Yes. Yes. So he's something way more than just a really good guy with a lot of understanding about God. So in the, in the very name of this child, we see the uniqueness of Christianity. What sets us apart? What makes us different? than every other quote-unquote religion. We see the difference and the uniqueness of Christianity in general, but we also see the uniqueness of Christ in particular. Yes. That he's different than every other religious leader that's ever been or ever shall be. So there's, a, there's an ocean of truth in one statement. Actually, there's an ocean of truth in one name. And his name shall be called Jesus. Yes. God with you. Emmanuel. Yes. Praise the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 1. Again, verse 45 this time. We're still talking about your promise. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Verse 45. If John was here, he'd tell you that that would be next. That's what he was doing to me with Sorry, John, I knew you weren't going to say that to your wife because you're going on with her. <laughs> and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Amen. So Elizabeth, this is Elizabeth, and she says, Mary's blessed if she believes what the Lord said when he sent this angel to speak to her, right? But immediately before that, look at verse 43 if you can, Sheila. Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord. And which is this to me? In other words, who is this coming to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What, what did I do to deserve the mother of my Lord coming to visit? Amen? Now, that's amazing. How can Mary's unborn not even conceived yet, child by the Lord, who sent the message about the unborn child, be the Lord. Remember, Elizabeth is prophesying here. This isn't just come, something coming rattling out of her intellect. This is a, the Holy Spirit has come upon her, it says. In fact, it, she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she does, does what everybody else does when they get the Holy Spirit. They begin to prophesy. Amen. So she's prophesying under the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It's not likely that she understood what she was even saying. Because a lot of times we prophesy, we don't have intellectual ability to, to make sense out of the whole thing. We just start saying stuff because we're being led by the Holy Spirit to say it. A lot of times it contradicts common sense. Amen? So it's not likely that she understood the meaning of everything that she was saying. But the implication is still clear. The baby about to be born is the eternal Lord God who sent her a message. The message that she's going to give birth to the Lord. Now think about this. I'm talking about this is what's going through Mary's mind. I'm going to give birth to the voice that just spoke to me that I'm going to give birth. Now, you've got a problem with your promise? I mean, the God that sent the messenger to me that I'm going to have a baby is the baby that I'm going to have. Now, you go and try to rationalize that and make some sense out of it or try to figure out how's that going to happen. It's impossible, is it not? Is your problem looking a little bit less complicated? Praise the Lord. So remember, the Hebrew idea of God was different from all the other cultures. When the Bible speaks of Jesus as divine, that doesn't mean that he, he had a, a little more godly character than everybody else. Or the pantheist uh, kind of way of thinking that God is in everything. And he just happens to have more God in him than everything else does. Jews don't look at it that way. The other pagan and, and other countries around them, other cultures, that's kind of the way they believed, but the Jews didn't look at it that way at all. The Hebrew God wasn't an impersonal force, something that was part of all life, but he was a unique, personal, yet infinite, transcendent, eternal creator. He was a real thing. So to call Jesus divine while having that understanding, while holding that kind of an understanding of divinity was stupendous. Right. It's off the charts yeah. to be able to say that knowing what they know about God. Right. You see what I'm saying? It's not like if it had happened in any other culture, they could have just kind of written it off as, well, he's got a little bit more of the divine spark, right. you know, than this or that or the other. No, this is, they understand God is a person. He's not just some great power force or some great energy out there. He is an individual person. Right. So to declare that this child is going to be divine mm -hmm. upsets every kind of thinking that you could possibly have. You've got to believe this is going to be God. Yeah. Yep. Now Mary may have been a very good young girl and a virgin, but that doesn't make her perfect. You know she still had thoughts, she had attitudes, she had issues, she had stuff like everybody else has stuff. And guys, you've got to believe yeah. that just because I'm a virgin, there were plenty of virgins in, in, in Israel, believe me. Yeah, right. Because to not be a virgin and not be married, you wouldn't live long. Right. You'd be stoned to death. Right. So this is, a, this is an amazing stupendous understanding. And yet, it is the linchpin of Jesus' own self-understanding. You've got to see, this is how Jesus saw himself. It's the, it's the key to how he understood him. And it, it underlies everything that Jesus teaches. That's why we read in in verse 47 or 48 here in, in Luke, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now he, if he didn't know that, if he didn't understand that, if he didn't know that to be true, he'd have never opened his mouth and said it, because you could be killed as quick for that as you could be an unwed mother. Right. Yeah. Right. Even more so, it was total blasphemy. Unless it were true. So you either have to say, Jesus Christ is, as the Bible says, the unique creator God 
who has come in flesh, which makes Christianity a better revelation of God than any other religion, just by virtue of that fact alone. Or you have to say he was wrong, he was lying, which makes him and us a worse revelation of God. But this truth says Christianity can't be a religion like others. It can't be. Because it's totally based on a whole different paradigm. Everything about it is different. When people make comparisons to all religions, they, have not, they don't have a clue as to who Jesus is or what Christianity is about. When I hear him talk that way, I think I'm listening to an idiot. I'm, I'm listening to somebody who doesn't know anything about Christianity. Now, they may think they do from a religious perspective, but they don't know anything about Christianity, or they couldn't say that. <clears throat> the fact that they even talk that way in comparison is the evidence of their own ignorance. I don't care how many degrees they have. I don't care what theology they, went, they have. I don't care what seminaries they went through or anything. I don't care. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't conform to the biblical truth. Right. Now look at Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 29, Sheila. So this is the context in which Mary is operating here. And it says, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. I guess she was. I guess, uh, I'm sure she was, amen? She was troubled. And cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So that word, when she, it says she cast in her mind, other, other uh, translations say she wondered but either way, the translation there is dio logistico, which is the original Greek, which means she used logic. She started to use logic based on what was being said to her. In other words, she's going to start thinking about what she's been taught, what she had read, what she knows about the Bible, what she knows about God, and she starts running all this through her head and starts trying to come out with a a logical explanation for what's being said to her. So Mary weighs the evidence, she weighs the consistency of the claims and concludes something outrageous. It must be true. She uses logic and reason and comes to the conclusion based on what was being said, this is true. Hallelujah. Amen? Now if Mary can do that, we need to be willing to use reason to weigh the promises that God gives us. If she could use logic, so you don't have to be stupid and just a faith fairy. I mean, it's, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be little faith. I'm just saying there's a logical way of looking at things, even in the scripture, that will validate and verify whether it's true or not. Praise the Lord. So the second thing Mary does is to express her doubt. She says to the angel, verse 34, see, we, we think, oh, I can't question, I can't wonder, I can't try to reason this thing, right? I got to just believe. She's, she's using rational logic here. But there's also doubts come up in the midst of this reasoning process, like it always does for anybody. Whenever you're trying to come to a logical conclusion about a situation you're dealing with, you start asking questions, right, if you're being honest. So then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I've never had sex? That's what she's saying. She's, she's, she's using logic here. She's saying, well, logically, this doesn't make sense because I've never known a man. I've never slept with a guy. I've never had sex with anybody. Right? So how, how's this going to happen? She doesn't say, well, you're an angel, so I'll just accept it. Come on, because that's what we could do. She could do. She could just say, oh, this is so supernatural. It must be. But she doesn't. Even in spite of the fact that it's an angel, she's saying, wait a minute now. I've never 
had intercourse with anybody, and you're telling me I'm having a baby. Look at verse 34. I just did, I'm sorry. So she says, she says what any rational person would say. I understand biology. I have a mother. She had a mother. I see babies being born all over the place. And I know you've got to have a man to do this. So it's not making sense. So she doubts. She questions. But there's two kinds of doubts. And this is what you need to think about when you're dealing with your promise. One kind of doubt is that you say simply, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. It's impossible. It's crazy. Who's going to believe something like that? Right? You're hearing the doctor's reports. You're hearing the lawyer. You're hearing the, the banker. You're hearing the judge. You're hearing whoever it is, and you're saying, I got a promise that God's going to give me custody. Now, you had two choices, didn't you? You could say, that's the dumbest thing I could imagine because everything in the natural tells me that's not going to happen. It can't happen. It's impossible. So you have, you can doubt it by saying, it's just stupid. It's just crazy. There's no point in even thinking about this. It ain't going to happen. I, it's, just, it's just insane. But that's the way, amen, of getting out of the hard work of thinking rationally based on the word of God. It's a cop-out. It's a, it's a lazy way of dealing with something that looks too difficult for you to figure out. So you just turn your back on it instead of asking questions about what can I do, how does this happen, how are we going to make this happen, how is it going to work, how, what, what does God say about it? You just go, that's just nuts. God says, I'm going to meet all your needs according to your riches, his riches and glory. You're looking at the financial statement. You're underwater. It looks like everything's going to blow up in your face. It's never going to happen. And the, you can do one of two things. <laughs> Thanks, Lord, but look, you know, I'm not stupid. So this is just insane. Or you could be less lazy and more intelligent and ask a question. Not just refuse the possibility of what God is saying, but ask the question. Because the question, when you, when you refuse the possibility of what God can do, you've eliminated anything that God would do. So he's, what he's saying is, you, you don't want to ask a question. Don't just refuse, because the possibility of the result of what you're asking. See, the real question, when you ask the real question, you're asking for information. You're asking for revelation. Yes. That leaves here, in this case, in Mary's case, it leaves her open to believe. Yes. She hasn't just written it off. Right. Even though she's doubting, her doubt actually leads her to believe. Right. So God's not, he doesn't care about your doubts. If you'll be honest and ask the right questions instead of just writing it off and saying that's just stupid, God can't do anything. But you doubt and you doubt, your doubt will cause you to question, which will lead you to believe. Yes. Say, so how does that happen? Well, for example, if, if she hadn't expressed doubt, the angel wouldn't have spoken one of the greatest statements in the Bible, which we've been quoting here all morning in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Hallelujah. If she hadn't questioned, we wouldn't have that revelation. If she hadn't doubted, we wouldn't have that reality today. Amen? Mary doubted, and we have extra revelation that we otherwise wouldn't have. It's not a bad thing. Right? Praise the Lord. The next thing Mary does is she believes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She doubts. God gives her revelation. Believe. Praise the Lord. After she hears nothing will be impossible with God, she makes her move. Actually, nothing will be impossible with God is a good argument. Pretty good argument for believing, isn't it? 
She doubts. She questions. She gets an answer. Yes. Right. Nothing's impossible with God. Right. That's a good argument. I don't think I can argue against it. No. I'll have to believe it. Right. Praise the Lord. So it's basically like this. Mary, do you believe in God? Yes. Well, if there's a God who created the world, who delivered Israel, now this is her history, who, who protected Israel for hundreds of years from their enemies, made them victorious, provided for them, delivered them, did all the things that he did, why couldn't he do this? Defeats all their enemies. Right? And as she makes these connections, she says, makes sense to me. Nothing's impossible. Because everything we've seen God do for Israel over millennia looked impossible at the time. Praise the Lord. Luke 138. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Praise the Lord. Just do it like you said it. Praise the Lord. I'll restore all your relationships. Do it like you said it, Lord. I'll provide all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Nothing's impossible with God. Good argument. Do it like you said it, Lord. By my stripes. Were healed. Hallelujah. Nothing's impossible with God. Do it like you said it, Lord. Yes. So we're making it simple, yes. but it's true. It's, true. Yes. it's really what Mary went through, only hers was much bigger because really it's like the beginning of all that God wants to do for the redeemed. Yes. Without this, there wouldn't have been any of that. Let's look at, look at this quickly. Uh, Luke 14, verse 28. And this, is, this is a continuation of what we're talking about, maybe in a little bit different context, but the, what, what, what's being said here is, is the same thing. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth, down, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? You got the goods. Can you do it? Nothing's impossible with God, right? That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about your ability. He's talking about what you believe. So you need to, before you go into the battle, because the devil's trying to rob and steal and kill, before you go into the battle, sit down and count the cost. You got, you got the cash to cover it. Have you got the, the means to do what you know, what it is you know you need to do. Amen. Yes. Amen. If you understand. You count the cost. But the problem is, in Christianity, most people want to negotiate the cost instead of counting the cost. Right? right? We want to figure out what's my part, how do I do this, how's it going to happen, how's this going to work out. We're negotiating. We're not counting costs. We're not saying, okay, X here. He said, by my stripes you're healed. That'll cover it. That'll be enough. That'll be, no, we're, we're trying to negotiate what's my part in this. God, will you do it for me because I haven't been perfect. I've got these issues. I made the situation the mess that it is. Now can I expect you to come? See, we're not. We're trying to negotiate. Okay, then I'll pray through again. I'll plead. I'll pray. I'll beg. I'll, I'll, I'll fast. I'll, I'll pray longer. I'll read more Bible. We're not counting anything. We're negotiating. We're trying to figure out how we can manipulate the circumstance rather than believe that nothing's impossible with God. When it comes to the promises of God, the hardest thing to give is in. Just give in. We're every other part of our life, we're taught we have to do stuff. There's nothing wrong with hard work. There's nothing wrong with determination and dedication and loyalty and all of that kind of stuff. But when it comes to God, those are meaningless. What God wants us to give is in. Give up. Give in, trust, believe, yeah. Yeah. and all things are possible. Mm -hmm. 
It's over and over in the Bible. You know, we could go on for hours just talking about these things like Gideon and others. But Abraham, just take Abraham, for example. God shows up. Abraham doesn't know God. He's got multiple gods. He's in Ur of the Chaldees. It's a pagan haven for, for idols and, and demon worship and all sorts of other stuff. And God shows up and he says, Abraham, get out of your homeland, leave your family, and I want you to leave Chal the, the, the Chaldees, and I want you to follow me. And Abraham says what any normal thinking person would say, where are we going? <laughs> right? right? And God says, I'll show you later. Come on. God says you're going to go to a place where there's no famine, where, where your needs will always be met, where everything is, and every place you set your foot will belong to you, it will be part of the kingdom of God. And Abraham says, where is it? I'll show you after a while. God's saying, I'm going to heal your body. Where's my healing? I'll show you. Just follow me. Just believe me. Just agree with me, and you'll see it. What about my relationship that's all screwed up? They're not interacting with me anymore. They're not talking to me. They won't have anything to do with me anymore. God says, I'll show you later. Just believe me. Where's the money, Lord? Where you said you were going to supply all of my need according to your riches and glory. And I got these bills piling up. Where's the money, Lord? Yeah. I'll show you later. Yeah. Right now, all you got to do is leave. Mm -hmm. What about my daughter? What about what the lawyers are saying? What about what the, the school's saying? What about what everybody is saying? Yeah. You and your house shall be saved. Yes. But what about... I'll show you later yes. what I've already done. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. In some fashion, you got to say what Mary said. Do what you said. Yes. Praise the Lord. Why in the world do you suppose Jesus came into this world to a teenager, unwed, in a culture that despised the very thought of that kind of behavior, who would have killed her instantly if they had known it ahead of time, if they had known what was going on. They abhorred that whole kind of thinking of fornication, adultery, anything like that. Was, I mean, it was the, the worst possible thing a person could do. Why would God do it there? God didn't have to do it that way. He could have done it any way he wanted to. But I think it's his way of saying, I don't do the things the way the world expects me. But I do them altogether opposite. Because my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weak people who will just simply believe what I've said. In spite of how it looks, in spite of what experiences they've had, they just, in their weakness, they just say, do it to me, Lord, just the way you said it. Amen. Because God is glorified in that. Yes. And our relationship is enhanced. Mm -hmm. Our intimacy becomes greater. Yes. He doesn't use powerful people. Rarely does he use powerful people. He rarely even uses famous people. Right. But he uses nobodies. He uses common people. He uses just the average guy and woman on the street who will believe, yes. who will just say, okay, Lord, yes. based on your word, nothing's impossible. Yes. I'm going to believe you. Yes. So the other thing that Mary does that we can learn from, she goes to Elizabeth, who speaks to her by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that again, Sheila, if you will, chapter 1, verse 45, Luke. And the amazing thing about this is we do stuff all the time. We don't understand there's even a biblical principle for it. <laughs> but, but there is. And it's everywhere, not just in one or two New Testament things. Actually, you've got to understand this is even from the New Testament. And blessed is she, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Amen? So what happened? Elizabeth encourages Mary. Praise the Lord. She's prophesying. She's testifying. She's saying, 
girl, you are going to be blessed because you're believing. You, know, you have no idea what kind of blessings come, and this is going to be outrageous. You are going to be freaking out by what God's going to do. Amen? It encouraged her. And what happens? Mary begins to worship. Let's look at verse 46 and 47. Now Mary's getting the Holy Ghost goosebumps. Amen? And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in my God, in God my Savior. Praise the Lord. Now I'm not going to read it, but if you take the time, because of the time I'm not going to, but you can go on and read down the rest of the way through that chapter, and you'll see what, what's happening here is that in that song, which is what the Bible refers to it as, Mary's song, Mary goes back through the Old Testament from Psalms and Isaiah and the prophets. And you can see what she says in that song. They are quotes from Psalms. They are quotes from Isaiah. They are quotes from other prophets about the Messiah. She's getting revelation. Because, because of Elizabeth's encouragement, Mary breaks out in the song, and the Lord begins to unfold the revelation of this Messiah. And now, where she was still wondering and trying to figure it all out, all of a sudden now it just pours out to her this truth, this reality. Why? Because she believed before she had all the evidence, God gives her more than enough after she begins to believe. Praise the Lord. So she gets the connections. She begins to make the connections and uh, that, that are all about revealing the Messiah. And those insights, those revelations came because she went and visited a sister believer. She went to somebody else. That's why we come together. That's why we forsake not the assembling of yourselves together because we're just trying to fill up a church building. But because our testimonies, our prophecies, our encouragement, just a handshake and a pat on the back and say, man, it's good to see you. You don't know. You don't know what's going on in that other person. How it may just be the impetus that they need to put them over the top for whatever it is God's telling them. They're fighting a battle every day, all day long, and it doesn't look like anything's changing. And all of a sudden, they come in and somebody says, praise the Lord. I believe God's going to do something great in your life. Hallelujah. And the next thing you know, you break out into song, little yeah. Holy come Ghost on. fit, amen, and start prophesying and testifying about what the Lord's going to do for you. Yeah. I mean, I heard Donnie doing it this morning. Yeah. I mean, he came in here. So upset, he wasn't going to say nothing. Yeah. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I went over because I, I had talked to him, and I said, Don, you want to talk? But you see what changes the atmosphere when you get believers together. Don't let anybody ever tell you you don't need a church. You just need the right church. Amen. You just need a church where people are free to share and experience, amen, what God is doing in their life. This is a huge story. Amen. That Mary is revealing how God moves in people's lives yes. and how tremendous he wants to move without limitations. Yes. I mean, come on. Right. God says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. Guess who the baby is? Me. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. That is overwhelming. Yes. So I don't know what your promise is. But I got a feeling it ain't quite that big. Yeah. It's not... So beyond the pale that it's impossible when all things are possible with God. Amen? Mary was a nobody who became greater than everybody. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Simply because God came to her, she responded, she reasoned, she doubted, she believed. She connected with others who believed. And so can you. And because of that, we can do all things by what Jesus has already done yes. for us. Yes. Amen. Amen. Just get, put that somewhere in your memory bank. Yep. And nothing yeah. shall be impossible yeah. with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And when you find yourself doubting, Amen. Call another believer. Go visit him. Get to church. I mean, that's why we come to church. Church isn't just so we can say we got a church. Yeah. You are the church. Yeah. When the people stop coming, there is no church. Yeah. The church needs to do what the church was meant to do. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
That's why we come together. For the preaching of the word, but for corporate worship, for testimonies, for prophetic words, for God to be able to lift us up and give us revelation so that we can believe. It's all for us. It's to our benefit. Amen? Nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing, nothing shall be impossible to you. Just believe it. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you all for uh, remembering my birthday. I'd like to forget it myself, personally. <laughs> Praise the Lord and just move on. But uh, I appreciate Mike and the, you say it's your birthday. Well, it's her birthday, too. <laughs> Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great week. Stay warm.